Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we'll be talking with Jeremy Begley, a project structural engineer with Gannett Fleming in the Dams and Hydraulics Group based out of Colorado about his passion for engineering and dams and the role that concrete gravity and arc dams play in providing vital resources to communities. We'll also discuss the benefits and drawbacks of these types of dams and the future of dam design and construction and the importance of having great mentors and a positive walk culture. And towards the end, we'll even get to hear about Jeremy's talent for voice impressions. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. And I'm your co-host, Rachel Holland. Now let's jump into the conversation of the week with Jeremy. I think my biggest struggle was I knew I was gifted, but didn't know how to use my gift. My boss at the time encouraged me to go back to school through Simpson's Education Reimbursement Program. Simpson said, hey, we see where you are, we see where you wanna go, we'll put you on the path to get there. Actually just recently finished my MBA degree. I like that Simpson cared about my personal goals as well as my professional goals. They gave me the space to develop who I was becoming. Welcome to the show. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what made you decide to become an engineer? Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm so happy to be here on this uh, podcast and, and share about my um, my career. So I think getting into uh, like how I got into dams and, um, you know, deciding to become an engineer, it kind of goes back to the beginning. I, I really didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, so uh, I would say I had a lot of influences in my life, like uh, such as my dad, who um, is a building contractor, and he also is a uh, he's an instructor at the local community college in Southern Colorado, Trinity State College. And so, just having that influence, I think, on my life, uh, seeing how uh, gave me an appreciation for good design and engineering principles. And I would say that also too, just in high school, I had I had a math teacher who uh, Miss Gongler, who really. I, I think had an influence on me uh, to say, hey, you know, you really are really good at math and science. I really think you should consider a career in engineering. So I just kind of kept that in, in the back of my back of my mind. And uh, when I graduated, um, I decided to attend the local community college. And that was kind of my non-traditional engineering path. I decided to do that, get some experience in, um, I signed up for the civil tech program at the time. Uh, to get some experience in, in engineering uh, in general, maybe get some drafting experience, and then that would make me uh, that would make me become, I think, employable, uh, and at least get those general skills. And while I was there, I actually uh, connected with uh, one of the adjunct faculty members uh, who just was there just for a semester, and he was a local engineer in the area, and he actually offered me a job after that semester. So that gave me an opportunity to actually put some of the engineering knowledge that I was learning from the classroom into practice. So we did a lot of uh, residential uh, and light commercial projects. So I did structural design and a little bit of architectural layouts and so forth with, with drafting. Um, and, and, and this, uh, the, the man's name was Bob Just, and he really became not just a, a boss, but a mentor as well as a, uh, a someone who I still look up today and he's a father figure in my life today. So that was a great opportunity. And I, uh, I really am appreciative that I was able to get that within my own community. And while I was attending college, I also met up some with some great um, professors, uh, such as Mr. Philbin and Ms. Clements, who really helped me uh, really kind of hone hone towards that that engineering uh, associate's degree to kind of help me uh, guide me in the process to then eventually go on to a four year university at Colorado State University and get my bachelor's degree. So those. Those kinds of things just happen. I have had a lot of great people in my life that really helped kind of guide me, including the advisors who helped me find scholarships and and whatnot to make it make it uh, easier to jump into in, into a four year university and make that a pathway for me to become who I am today. So that was that's just kind of the intro there of of just kind of getting my start in in engineering, and then I ended up going to Colorado State. 
um, where I had you know some amazing professors and, and fellow colleagues, and I got my undergrad in civil engineering. And at that point, I graduated and I wanted to get a real world experience uh, in the field. So I ended up actually working for uh, URS, which then later became AECOM. And I was doing structural design of a lot of heavy industrial projects. So oil and gas projects, as well as uh, towards the end of my time there, I was working on nuclear projects. And that's what got me, I started doing, you know, really heavy um, structural design in, the, in, that, uh, in that realm. But I realized it wasn't really what I, I wanted to do. I, I'm definitely an extrovert. I love being around people. And it was more focused on kind of like uh, churning out a lot of calculations and design. It was a little slower pace, especially in nuclear, that I wasn't really wanting. So I decided to kind of change my, my, uh, my I wanted, I was looking for a change in, in my career. And this is where I think that having a good network of people in your life and friends and colleagues really comes into play. And uh, I have a, one of the, one of my friends, uh, Amy Korn, who I believe was actually she was on your podcast, I think, episode 21, I think it was. So she's actually been here on the podcast. She she told me I should meet uh, up with her uh, her boss and mentor, Guy Lund, uh, who's got like 30 plus years of experience in dams and talk to him. So I made the opportunity to go talk with him and seeing his passion and his desire to be, you know, be a dam engineer and be a structural engineer's focus uh, on dams it really was uh, convincing and very almost contagious, that kind of passion. And I, I wanted to be a part of that. So I made this just a switch uh, seven years ago and got into dams. I love hearing yeah, all the cool. like influences that you've had in your life. And um, I mean, they always say it has like, you know, you're really fortunate to have that. And um, also then like considering how you're paying it forward, you know, I like, I love that about um, just our profession in general. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. A, a privilege to be a, a you know a structural a civil engineer that we get to give back to society and and help our communities. Yeah, and I think how you mentioned that you had so many mentors to to guide you, and I think uh, I think a lot of us have that you know kind of that words all you need are those words of encouragement to pursue something that you weren't really ready to do, but you just needed that little push, and maybe you'll you'll check it out, and then. I think that's where how we all got to, to where we are today. Uh, you did mention you had one of your mentors talk about dams, and in an exciting way. So what 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 did he actually like say that triggered you? Like, oh, this is this is I'm switching my entire career from you know typical <laughs> structures. I'm going into dams. Like, what was it about it? I know the enthusiasm, but were were there anything? I guess what was the sales pitch <laughs> on dams? Well, you know, it was just just talking to to him in general about because to be honest, in school, I've never learned about a career in dams. I kind of always looked at structural engineers do new projects, and you're always designing something something from scratch, and you're going to see it be built. I never thought like, okay, uh, something that's already built, what am I going to do? What what is what is there to do? Uh, so I never considered, never crossed my mind. And when I talked to him, uh, and he was telling me a little bit about. Uh, the industry in general is we get to you know really analyze these these structures that have been around for decades. I mean they're they're they've been built. A lot of them were built in the some of them at the turn of the century. A lot of them, of course, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Uh, just just a lot of um, um, they go back so long, and 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 we have an obligation, I think, to be good stewards of that infrastructure to ensure that they stand for another 50 years or or, or more, and. When he, when he told me about it, he goes, you know, you're going to be working on um, a lot of heavy seismic analysis and, you know, uh, flood analysis. And we're not just dealing with, okay, we're talking about a hundred year um, flood, or you're talking about a, um, an, an earthquake, you know, that's, um, you know, a hundred year earthquake or a 200 year earthquake, 2,500 year earthquake. We're talking the maximum credible earthquake. So we're talking, uh, some of these can be on the order of 10,000 year events. These are huge, huge events. So we're talking massive loads, and many of these structures were not designed for that load in mind. Uh, the, the, you know, the 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 history behind seismic uh, hazard analysis really is a relatively new field, and we're learning more and more 
about uh, you know the seismic hazards in various regions. Some regions are experiencing more seismic hazards than others, and we're learning more and more about that. And so getting a chance to um, see how he was able to uh, you know, showcase that there's a lot of work that's involved in analyzing these structures to ensure that they're able to withstand and be and keep the residents safe downstream, ensuring that uh, you know there's not going to be um, a lot of our dams are high hazard dams. And when I say high hazard, I, I don't mean that they're at risk of failing. It's th just that the there's a lot of residents who would be inundated in the event of an of um, an event so uh, occurring. So. When he was telling me about that, and the other thing that also was is interesting is that it's not code driven; it's it's guidelines based. So we're not talking about okay, we're going to look up um, in the code and we're going to see that we need to apply, you know, like Ashto or any of these other other industries. We're really really looking at things from a failure mode perspective, developing those failure modes from like okay, if you get this flooding event or this seismic event, how does that progress through and lead to a, a you know a failure or an uncontrolled release of the reservoir? Um, so we're, we're tracking that through and we're relying uh, heavily on engineering judgment too. And the fundamentals are very much emphasized. So we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, mechanics and materials. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, the, the basic building blocks of our engineering curriculum and applying that. We are, we are us using parts of the codes, of course, but we're not relying on them to tell us a kind of step-by-step -step what to do. Every project is unique. And um, I think what's so cool about it is that like one of the selling points too was, you know, in, in many, in some industries in, in structural engineering, you can, you can get your, to your 10 year mark and maybe you know a lot. Um, in dams, you can get to your 25 year mark and you're just barely hitting your stride. And that's what's so cool. I see so many people that are older, like, um, you know, partially retired and they still have such a passion to want to continue to work. And that to me, I want to be a part of that. And that, that was the selling point for me. I Sorry, love kind seeing, of a long winded answer. <laughs> no, it's great. I love seeing the passion that you have and like talking about why it's so fascinating. Is there, um, is there, can you say why like the concrete gravity and arc, uh, the arch dams are so interesting to you personally? Oh, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, like we talked about every single project is just unique. There's only, and only about 20% of the dams in the country are concrete dams. Uh, but every project has, has a unique um, aspect to it. You could put the same dam, you could have the same design of the dam, but apply it in a different geographic location and you completely changed up your analysis. You might have a different seismic event, different flooding event. Uh, you also have to, uh, you know, even might have concerns that are different for each of those structures. Like um, when they built that, when they, when they were gathering up the, uh, materials like the uh, aggregate, you might have concerns over uh, alkali silica reaction, ASR. And that's something to also consider in some of that. So where they were hit, getting the materials from, uh, you have, you know, you also have to kind of take into account the, the geography of the region and, and just you're, you're dealing with these incredible iconic structures too that have been around for decades. And you get to be a part of ensuring that they are around and stay around uh, for another generation or two so that um, people can get their water supply, their uh, hydropower, their um, irrigation for agriculture, as well as the nice thing too, one of the other benefits of this is, you know, you also get recreation out of the deal too. <laughs> so it's kind of cool. Yeah, it seems like uh, these dams, they're not just like these single structures. It's community base basically the dam is helping an, an entire community or or cities and you're not building them every day it seems like there's a lot of maintenance but in terms of anal analyzing them for like the latest codes and things it, yeah it seems like a really creative uh work process because like you were saying it's not just open the code book step one step two step three there's probably a lot of uh advanced analysis techniques and probably some nonlinear performance-based design with all the new seismic codes and, okay, how are we going to apply this to dams? And all the dams are different. So yeah, I, I I get that. that. That sounds pretty cool. And you did mention that only about 20% of the dams in the U.S. are concrete. Uh, can you, could you share some of uh, the advantages of concrete dams and maybe some of the disadvantages on why they're only 20%? Yeah. Um, you know, so one of the biggest... Uh, 
reasons why the dams are um, only 20% or about concrete are that they're expensive. They're expensive to build. And and the other the other aspect too is the geographic location of some some structures are, do not allow for, I'd say, the use of concrete. Uh, for example, if you're in a very flat environment such as Florida, um, usually you see more levees and, and and more embankment dams, and that um, because that's the material that you have readily available. And uh, whereas in the West, there's a lot of op more opportunity for concrete dams because you have uh, a lot of narrow canyons, you have the ability to kind of, especially for arch dams, you get to use the canyons to help buttress the dam and hold and hold it in place. So I think that um, the other uh, the other thing that from a, a disadvantage standpoint is that, like I said, the economics are probably probably the pretty much the 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 main driver. Uh, from an environmental stamp, uh, standpoint, too, I think a lot of people are concerned about you know concrete and you know the CO two emissions that you get from from that. Um, I think um, the the nice thing is about the work that I do on existing infrastructure is that we're trying to preserve it. We're not trying to build something new. So we're really, I think, being environmental stewards to help uh, ensure that this stays around for longer instead of having to build something brand new and incorporating more, new concrete and whatnot. Um, so uh, those are, I think, some of the the pros uh, and the cons. Like I said, that the failure mechanisms are. Um, of, of embankment structures are there's a lot more there. You could have, you know, an animal burrow, a burrow that could lead to piping failure and you know water getting through from one end to the other, and that could that could sabotage your dam. There's again, there's lots of inspections that occur, but with concrete, you don't have to worry about that. And most most of the time, the failure driver is actually in the foundation, uh, where there's not a lot of failures that really occur within the structure itself. It's mostly you're many times as good as you as good as the material that you're founded upon. So I, I'm definitely biased, but I do prefer concrete dams. And uh, as a structural engineer, I think uh, um, I, I'm not I'm, I'm not as uh, interested in geotechnical as much as I am in uh, materials like concrete and steel. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you another question about like um, the concrete gravity and arch dams. And before I do that, I was actually thinking a little bit more about like maybe some of our younger listeners and. Um, just curious, since a lot of people that do get into structural engineering don't get into dams, could you explain uh, just like briefly um, a concrete gravity dam versus an arch dam? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I should have started with that. Um, so a concrete gravity dam is a, is a dam where you're relying simply on the mass of the structure uh, to hold it in place. So they're very, they're very large uh, concrete structures. And typically, they're unreinforced. Um, in fact, mo concrete, most concrete arch dams and gravity dams are unreinforced. You're relying surely on the weight of the structure in a mass concrete dam to hold back the forces of the reservoir uh, from sliding or overturning. And that's what you're relying upon. In an arch dam, you're, you're using the, um, the beauty of the arch, just like in arch, um, like the Colosseum, where you have arch, arches all around. You're relying on the compression throughout the throughout the arch to, to go through the structure and then into the abutments or into the column that it's supporting. Similarly in dams, we're using the compression effect. You put the, um, the arch into the reservoir. So the reservoir is pushing on the arch there and the forces are transferred through compression into the uh, left and right abutments of the dam. And so that's, and you know, what's really fascinating about this uh, sidetrack on that is that, um, you know, arch dams, you know, when, when we really were building them in the heyday back in the, you know, the 30s and 40s, um, they were really the NASA of that day. They were, before space travel, like we were, that was like pushing the envelope on design. They were trying to cut back on material cost uh, and try to, you know, they built these amazingly, uh, you know, ornate structures. They both sometimes are curvature in both of the upstream uh, and down, uh, curvature upstream and downstream, as well as curvature, uh, they call them double curvature arch dams where you see it also curvature in the um, vertical direction. So they're just, they were doing all they could to push the envelope to ensure that material costs were lessened. And I think uh, when you think about that too, at that time, labor was a lot cheaper. Material was was your biggest driver. Um, I think that today it probably is both, but <laughs> you know, you have uh, um, really, they had a, a huge supply of skilled labor to help build these structures. And so they were pushing the, um, pushing the envelope on design. And I think that's just one of the cool, fascinating things about arch dams in general. 
Awesome. Okay. Thank you, Jeremy. I think that some people, I appreciated that explanation and I think some other people will as well. So I'll add one more thing too. There's yeah. a couple other dams that are also concrete that I just want to bring up is that you have uh, um, slab and buttress dams um, that are, are si uh, simply a buttress and a reinforced concrete slab. That's another type of dam as well that's out there. Uh, Amberson is was a type of uh, patented dam that they have. So that's another version of a concrete dam that's out there. And uh, we also have, um, uh, there's also cyclopean concrete, which was some, which is essentially giant rocks, that large aggregate that is then grouted in place using, um, using just grout. So you're rotting grout into place. And so there's, there's a variety of different, there's a few other dams out there, but uh, like I said, my focus has mostly has been on um, arch and gravity and with the, uh, with a, with a little bit of slab and buttress work as well. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, so looking at where your focus has been then more specifically, can you talk a little bit about how those types of dams play into providing hydroelectric power and water resources for the communities? Oh, absolutely. I think in, in general, you know, these, these structures, when you think about like iconic dams, you think of Hoover, you think of Grand Coulee, you think of Glen Canyon, and these dams are so, um, we, we need it for our, for our, especially for the West areas where you think of our arid regions, where we rely on it to uh, supply the agricultural needs for irrigation. Uh, it provides the water for a lot of these cities that honestly couldn't survive without the, the water resources that we do provide them. I, I don't think Vegas or Phoenix would ever exist if it weren't for the dams that are there today. Um, and then in regards to hydropower, um, that is just, I think, one of the uh, the ultimate benefits of, of dams. And I think you get the ability to have uh, supply the power for these cities to function. And it's it's good clean energy that you're also getting from it. So you're getting kind of a uh, an extra bonus effect onto it. And, and concrete dams in, in general have allowed us to build into, like I said, these narrow canyons and these, these places where it looks like well, what are we what are we going to put here? You know, and you can get that height, you can get the uh, you know the longevity that you need out of these structures, and I think that's where the the major benefit for concrete dams playing a role in our communities. And many times people don't realize how much they're relying on their uh, on their dams for just you know turning the water on for their faucet or uh, being able to um, uh, you know just live in the communities that they live in. These may not be exist if it weren't for the reservoirs around our country. Yeah, it's like uh, what the civil engineers in terms of all the things that we take for granted, uh, like you mentioned, turning on the faucets, water, electricity, the, the civil engineers and all the structural buildings that we live into. So I think that's pretty cool in terms of the civil engineering profession. A lot of stuff we take for granted, but that's civilization right there. You mentioned some analysis method and up updating you know, especially with the new seismic codes and the codes are always being updated. How, what type of technology uh, do you use or how does technology change when you're analyzing concrete dams and what can we see in the future for, for structural analysis? Yeah, I, I think uh, what we're seeing, I mean, in terms of seismicity, many times with dams is there's actually uh, uh, specialized engineers that, that do seismic hazard assessments. So they're, they're site specific um, seismic evaluations. So you get those results of what the PGA is, what the response spectrum might be. You're not really pulling this like, you know, an, you know, in building analysis, you're usually pulling from ASC 7 or some other code that you might pull from. Uh, we actually are usually getting our data um, directly from a site-specific assessment. Uh, so that's something unique about dams as well. Um, in regards to technology, you know, I think um, there's always there's always something to be said for uh, the simple tools that we have at our disposal, such as you know survey survey monuments and you know using the tools of uh, like piezometers and extensometers and understanding you know pressures and and how that you know looking at little at data cues to see what we're seeing from the operators at the dams and that they're they're constantly monitoring all this. But in regards to the future, I think that one of the things that I've had the benefit of, of being involved in has been performance-based testing. And that's been, that's been incredible. So really it's, it's focused on the dynamic uh, analysis of, of dams. And 
Uh, regardless of whether you're looking at something statically or dynamically, a static analysis is essentially a dynamic analysis with acceleration equal to zero. So, but every single structure has a, um, a an inherent characteristic with its natural frequencies and mode shapes. And I think understanding um, using performance-based testing to um, you know, what we what I've done in the past is with Dr. Ziad Drone. He's he's kind of developed a lot of great technology for this with his students at Harvey Mudd um, has been to take a um, take accelerometers at a dam. And usually you could use either like flow induced monitoring. So let's say they're spilling out of a, out of a spillway um, during like the spring runoff season. You could use those vibrations to, um, to get us kind of like a, an energy applied to the system and kind of see what kind of, uh, uh, of frequencies you're getting. You could convert the accelerations uh, into, uh, you know, in, in the time domain and convert them into the frequency domain and get an idea of, okay, what kind of frequencies are we getting here? And if you apply that, um, it, you could you could use that in your numerical models, you know, these finite element models that we're using to try to help calibrate your models to see uh, how that aligns. I, I, know, I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, but it gives you a benchmark. And I think that's something too in, in um, in uh, our industry is we don't have the benefit to test our structures to failure. You know, that's not, that's not an option. Um, so, but it, performance based testing might give you an idea to, to see, okay, well, what kind of, wh where am I at right now? How, 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 what's the, what's the frequency of the structure right now? And if there's changes to that frequency over time, similar to kind of like um, when you go to the doctor and you get an EKG for your heart, you kind of know if something has changed, you're going to notice change. You might not see a change in your body, but maybe your, your heart's starting to notice a few different changes in there. And so I think there's there's definitely some power behind it. Um, it's a matter of, I think, uh, enhancing our ability to marry the numerical model and the um, performance-based testing together. And that's going to be the challenge because there's so many various parameters involved. Um, and, you know, between, you know, the modulus of your structure, you got uh, of your, of your, um, Concrete, you have the modulus of the foundation that is resting upon. You have multiple, you have redundant load paths. So many times where this can travel, you might have cracks in your in your concrete that you don't know how that's changing the the modulus of your structure either. So, and some of this stuff might be evident by visual observations, which is which is very important too. You know, don't underestimate visual observations, but uh, to know there might be things that are hairline cracks that you may not even be able to see. And I think that's where performance-based testing might be able to give you clues and indications of whether something is is changing over time. Uh, so that's where I kind of see the industry will eventually get to. Um, again, I think we're, we're borrowing concepts and 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 um, concepts from our colleagues in the aerospace and um, uh, aeronautic and mechanical um, engineering realm to pull from and maybe apply that to our structures. Because we we don't have the luxury of testing these to failure. We don't like they have the luxury to build prototypes, break it, and see what the limit is. We can't do that. <laughs> we we so uh, this is an opportunity I think to do it non destructively. I am going to kind of resort or refer back to when we were talking earlier about some of the um, people that sort of got you into engineering and the mentors that you've had. It sounds like uh, you spoke obviously very highly of them and there's still a lot of them are still in your life today. Um, can you share a little bit more on the importance of these roles in your career? I mean, I, it's definitely something when I'm out talking to newer engineers or having conversations with them, I always encourage them to look for, look for these mentors in their in their realm to, to kind of just lead them along the way as they grow in their career. I think it's really important too. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about um, the importance of them in your career. I think having, you know, multiple mentors in life is, is extremely important uh, for both career as well as just life in general, you know, having people that are in your corner and helping you learn and grow and develop your skills. You know, that's where I see a mentor really helping. And you don't need to have a mentor that works with you sometimes. Sometimes you can go look outside of your, even your field and find somebody that can help you uh, and, and just talk to you about, hey, you know, what have I done with my career? You know, my career trajectory, where do I want to be? You could have those types of people in your life. And I also think there's a very important place for cheerleaders, uh, people in your life that are out there cheering you on, your family, your friends, 
people that are, are out there just in your corner and making sure that you're going to succeed. And when you're having, you know, a downtime that you have those people that you could fall back on and rely on. So th there's definitely a, a place for both, both mentorship and cheerleaders. And sometimes that person serving as mentor can be both a cheerleader and mentor. And there's many times where I think, um, again, I'm very much into the pay it forward kind of approach. You know, you want to be able to become that mentor to somebody else, as well as, uh, your, your mentee, but you could also become a mentor. And uh, I think there's just so much to learn. And I know that my, my company, Gannett Fleming, really does emphasize mentorship and really tries to um, find people to get connected, even if it's outside of their, their uh, particular expertise. And that's been, I think, a, a, great, a great thing as well. And if you don't have a mentor, I tell people, you know, find one. There's so many people that are willing to serve that role. I mean, whether it be a professor, whether it be a, you know, a person, a, a coworker, um, a supervisor, so many people would be willing to do that. So find that in your life for sure. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more on that one. Yeah. I know even professional organizations, I think they're getting the importance of the mentorship. So yeah, if you, if you can't find one, I know professional organizations are offering programs to make that, that easier as well. Yeah, good point, Matt. And that's, that's a good point. Before we dive in, we'd like to recognize our sponsor for this episode, PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the FE and PE exams. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the FE and PE exams the first time. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. Check out PPI today at ppi2pass.com to see all the options available for FE and PE exam prep. Now let's dive into today's episode. Yeah, and Jeremy, I know you're an advocate for, for humor and levity in your work. Uh, why do you think that's important to have fun in the workplace? And can you give us some examples? I hear you do some voice impressions and <laughs> you know, I to bring positive work culture and, and bring your two together. Well, I feel very fortunate to work in, a, in an environment where I think there's a lot of people besides myself that also bring their own personality and mix of, of levity to, to the workplace. Uh, but I, I think it's extremely important because, uh, you know, I, I was, you think about the connections that you make with people. Sometimes sharing a laugh with somebody can just be such a great bond. And I think... I was actually listening to a TED talk not that long ago that talked about how there really is a human connection involved with laughing and you can develop, I think, stronger ties to your team members. And that's important to have in a workplace. And I think, uh, um, you know, we, we do, we have a serious role as structural engineers. Like, I mean, society is depending on us uh, and we do need to take that very seriously, but it doesn't mean that we can't have fun and enjoy what we do too and, and bring our, bring our whole selves to the office. So, I don't know. Some of the things I like to do, I like doing voice impressions and, and um, I'll, I'll give you an example of such. Okay. <laughs> Let me take a drink of water here first. <laughs> <clears throat> so first of all, I'll, I'll use, um, I'm going to, I'm going to take this time to just uh, thank EMI and the podcast. Okay. As Donald Trump. <laughs> So first of all, I just want to say you guys are doing a tremendously great job. I really think that this is an amazing podcast. You're bringing great, really great awareness to the field of structural engineering. I mean, really, uh, I think a lot of people need to know about it. A lot of people really do. And uh, it's not just me. It's bipartisan, too, I think. So like, listen to Bernie Sanders tell you this, too. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Trump. I really do appreciate it. I think... That, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity for people, students, uh, and, and other professionals to share what they know about their career in structural engineering. We need more people to get involved. We need more people to be here. And the best part about this podcast, in my opinion, is it's completely free. You can go and download it. And wherever you get a, wherever you have your subscription, just go get it. Get the podcast there. Uh, you know, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sanders, for that. Uh, Senator Sanders, I really do appreciate it. Uh, you know, I think... Uh, as you and and uh, Mr. Trump said, I think that there's a, a great opportunity to really share uh, what uh, what structural engineers do for our society. We many times we take them for granted. We just kind of express express or just ex I'm sorry, I'm getting a little tongue tied here, but uh, we pretty much just expect to have that our infrastructure will just we go across a bridge, it's going to stand. We go and we have water running out of our faucet, it's going to be there. We need to do better about making sure that that is understood, and these civil engineers 
are the responsible for that. <laughs> and I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, uh, Mr. Biden. <laughs> so, so, so here's the deal. Everybody needs to do their part of, of trying to share what we do. And I think this podcast does just that. I mean, really, it's great, great stuff. So, so just kudos to you guys for what you guys are doing and just bringing awareness to structural engineering. Thank you. <laughs> do you do this on so stage great. too? I no, I don't. Ask. I do not you do it should. on stage. You should take no. it somewhere. This needs yeah. to be beyond the workplace. <laughs> yeah, some some stand up or uh, office stand up. Or... <laughs> Absolutely. Talent yeah, show, talent show. Yeah, that was great. I, I I definitely agree with that. I mean, I, I know when in in terms of you were saying even some of the seriousness of our our jobs. Yeah, it's serious. It's um, I had some some friends in the military and their stuff is serious, but I think one of the things that I, I learned from them is it's a serious job, but it's super important to have that, uh, that levity, that humor. And you can kind of see them when they're around each other too. They're, you know, they're always cracking jokes and it's serious, but I think that's how you can kind of get, get through that. And it definitely builds that bond and work culture. So I, I think that's great. Yeah. I, well, I appreciate what you guys are doing. I think this is an, a great podcast and opportunity to really broadcast it. Like I would say one of my personal missions is to bring awareness to like the career option that I'm in in dams. I really want to encourage students to consider uh, structural engineering, not, not just, uh, and I think buildings and bridges is, is great, but also consider that there is definitely a career in dams too. Don't just think that existing infrastructure is, is all that, uh, it, it, there's nothing to do. There's a lot to do. And I know that there's no uh, ribbon cuttings for, uh, hey, we're doing more maintenance. This is great. Uh, <laughs> uh, or we're doing more more uh, analysis on this structure. Not really the exciting parts uh, of what people think of, but it is a, is a very important thing. And if, if anyone does have a chance to, to listen to or watch, I think it's John Oliver's skit that does, it's called infrastructure. If you just type that in and watch on your own time, it really is a really funny skit kind of about um, just, just our infrastructure in general and what, um, um, just bringing awareness to the importance of it. It's not the most exciting, but he tries to make it exciting, make it into a movie. So. <laughs> Excellent. I'll have to check cool. that out. Yep. Yeah, me too. Um, Jeremy, I, I want to thank you for providing us with all this insightful information today. And then I was also curious if you can let our listeners know how they can connect with you. Yeah, well, thank you for this time today. And I, I would say the best way to connect with me is just to go to LinkedIn and find me. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you will find the summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 103, as well as links to any of the resources or websites mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.